All right, Genesis 29, we're going to read the first 30 verses of Genesis 29. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east, and he looked. As he looked, he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. For out of that well the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large, and when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where do you come from? They said, We are from Haran. He said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, We know him. He said to them, Is it well with him? They said, It is well, and see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. He said, Behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go pasture them. But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we will water the sheep. While he was speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things, and Laban said to him, Surely you are bone and my flesh. You are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went in to Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served mm -hmm. Laban for another seven years. All right. So again, a familiar account. <clears throat> and uh, there's, there's also similarities with what happens in Laban's experience, uh, experience here or other events in previous chapters that probably immediately came to your mind. Like as we were reading through that, there's at least two previous events that we've already studied that immediately our minds go to as we read this narrative. Any, any, any Anything come to your mind as we read through this? What's that? Watering the animals, what, what do you, okay, providing water for them. What previous, was there a previous okay. event? Exactly, right. So the 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 servant of Abraham going to get the wife of Rebecca, very, very many parallel ideas here and things that happen. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Good. And then what else, when you read this, can you not help but think of that just occurred a couple chapters previously? Okay. <clears throat> so Jacob was the deceiver. He was the tricker in two cases, right, previously with Esau and then with Isaac, mm -hmm. and now Jacob himself is being tricked. So we're going to, as we work through the narrative, we're going to see, obviously, in the providence of God, which is a major theme in this section, 
those two events factor in considerably. And in fact, as we've seen over and over again, because Moses, the author here, is a master storyteller, uh, he deliberately uses language that parallels um, these events in order to draw our attention to it. And actually, also interestingly, later when Moses gets his own wife, um, how he tells that story, he draws language parallel to these two because he's he's sort of trying to draw parallels between his own his own situation and how Isaac got his wife and then how Jacob got uh, his wife. So we find here in the opening verses, uh, Jacob leaves the promised land, right? We talked uh, last week about the significance of that. Here is a land that had been promised to Abraham, promised to Isaac, promised to Jacob. And uh, Abraham and Isaac spent most of their lives in the promised land. Abraham left once, but it was, you know, he shouldn't have done that. And it almost seems like they're beginning to really settle in. Um, Abraham makes his first land purchase in the uh, burial plot for Sarah. And then when he dies, he is buried in that burial, burial plot. So now they actually own some land in the promised land. And Isaac is gaining a reputation. We saw in his life, uh, he really establishes himself in the land. He doesn't, he doesn't dwell in land that he owns, but he is respected by Abimelech and the other people that make a, make a covenant with him, a covenant of peace. And so it seems like, you know, from the, from the reader's perspective, okay, things are moving in the right direction. This land that God has promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're coming into possession of it. You know, pretty soon we're going to see, they're going to start buying up more and more land, and then they're going to, they're going to gain it all. And because of Jacob's own sin and deception, his trickery, he ends up getting expelled from, from the promised land. He, he's sent off into exile, as it were. Uh, and of course, um, the people of Israel listening to Moses tell them this the first time are probably thinking of their own exile in Egypt. And then they're about to return now to the land. And here is their forefather, Jacob who they know, I mean, it's not, we haven't gotten to that part of the narrative yet, but they know their own history. Uh, Jacob and his sons are the ones who first go to Egypt because of the famine, which is coming up. Uh, but now they're about to return to the land. And here they are now hearing the story of how their forefather, Jacob, Israel, uh, who his name will be, uh, is being expelled from the land because of his own sin. But remember what just happened in the last section. He's on his way out, but he has this amazing visit from the Lord in which God affirms his covenant with Jacob. It's probably Jacob's personal conversion experience. God hadn't factored into Jacob's life at all up to that point. It had only been deception. And now he meets with God. God speaks to him. And we saw the significant response of Jacob and how he vows to the Lord that God will be his God. He promises he will give him a full tenth of all that he has. He will give that to the Lord. And so Jacob at this point seems committed. He seems to recognize the hand of God. And that's going to factor in uh, to our interpretation of this chapter. We'll see there's some disagreement among some scholars about how to take some of the events. Like Jacob planting a kiss on, on Rachel you know, so quickly. Uh, but I think you have to view some of these things in light of the previous verses. Moses paints Jacob in a very positive light in his response to God appearing to him at Bethel. And so when we open uh, in verse 1 of chapter 29, the, the phrase here we have in the ESV is, then Jacob went on his journey. Literally in Hebrew, is it, it, it is, then Jacob lifted his feet. It's really sort of a he had a he had a he had a, a a positive step now, whereas he was leaving the promised land dejected, worried about Esau trying to kill him. He's probably never going to see his parents again. He probably he thinks he's leaving with his head down after Bethel. He leaves with his head up, and he has sort of a skip in his step. That's the that's what's being communicated here in Hebrew. So again, Moses is really portraying this in a positive light. He knows now God has promised to be with him. Even if he leaves the land, God, God has promised to be with him. And so he goes on his journey with that kind of optimism that God is going to direct his paths. And we do see that, do we not, in this text? We see over and over again several indications that God is indeed with Jacob. What are, what are some things in the narrative we just read 
that are very clear indications that God is keeping his promise and God is with him and God is directing his steps. Right into tonight's world, the place and the people. Okay. Yeah, I mean, no Google Maps, right? No, I mean, how, how is he going to find his, his mother's family? And God directs him right there. Okay, clear indication. What else? Yeah, there was no resistance. He was welcomed. I mean, not only does he find the place, and this is this is significant to the narrative, right? He he goes to the well. The first people he see, he says, "Do you know Laban?" And they're like, "Yeah, we know Laban." Wow, imagine that. And then he's like trying to inquire about you know Laban. He's probably moving towards. Well, can you tell me where he lives? Right? Uh, how is he doing? Oh, he's doing fine. In fact, here's his daughter. Right? Uh, so he's he he doesn't have to even find where Laban lives. And what's he there for in the first place? to get married. Uh, and here is Rachel, who we find later in the text is a, you know, drop dead gorgeous woman. Um, so that's a plus, right? In in Jacob's eyes. So over and over again, we're, we're finding here indications that God is indeed with Jacob. And we're going to see even in the, the negatives, the trickery that is played upon him in the providence of God, it is all part of God's plan and, and, and is also an indication that God is with him, which is, of course, a lesson that we need to learn uh, often that we, you know, I, I it, it often bugs me a little bit and I shouldn't be too bugged because I understand it. You know, if somebody has a trial and they come through the trial and everything turns out great, like, like say my dad, for, for example, had cancer, he's through the cancer, everything seems to be good. We often say, God God was really with him. God was really gracious. And that's true. But God would have also been gracious and been with him if he had not survived, right? And so I, I know what we mean, but we need to view even the negatives from our earthly point of view as God's people. We need to view them as God's gracious hand. Even if, you know, even if uh, there's a thorn in our flesh and we pray for God to remove it and he never removes it, well, that's a grace. There's a reason for that. God has a reason for even the the negative providences. And so we're going to see that in the text. We've already seen that, of course, with the fact that God used the deception of Jacob and Rachel to accomplish the purpose that he had established all along. God does that, right? And we'll see even in the, the negatives of this text that there are, there are positives in the providence of God. So that seems to be why, for example, Jacob weeps and kisses Rachel. Now, again, there's a little bit of debate. I heard some chuckling over here when we got to that, that narrative, like, whoa, he's a little forward. Um, and some people take it that way. I mean, Rick Phillips, the commentary that the teachers are, are using as sort of a core, uh, he argues that that was a bad thing, that he shouldn't have done that. Uh, John Calvin, even, his commentary, he's like, was this recorded correctly? I mean, he literally asked the question, was this recorded correctly? Because that wasn't a good thing. Uh, but you have to remember, I think, again, in the ancient Near Eastern culture, this wasn't a you know forward romantic kiss sort of thing, right? She was family, right? She was a a, a second cousin or whatever, um, and 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 the same thing happens when they go to Laban's house and Laban runs out and what does he do? He runs out and he kisses Jacob. It's just what you do with family. That seems more likely to me what is happening with Jacob, and it's because he is so elated that God is already proving his faithfulness to what he had just told him in Bethel. God said, I will be with you. And so Jacob leaves with a skip in his step. He's confident in the Lord's goodness. He's committed himself to the Lord and he doesn't have to wander around searching. God directs him right to the right well, right to the right shepherds. Rachel meets him and then takes them to Laban. He is, he is elated. And you can see how elated he is. I mean, this, what, what is all this business about the, the rock on the well and all of that? Why would Moses take all of that, that time to talk about this rock that's on the, on the well? Any ideas? You, you understand what's going on there? So he makes a big point here that it's a very big, heavy rock. And apparently it seems like the, uh, the all the shepherds, it takes all of them to move this rock. Like when, when Jacob sees Rachel and he's like, hey, you know, water your sheep and get out of here. Uh, they're like, no, we can't yet because all the sheep are not here yet. All the shepherds are not here yet. We need to wait for everybody so that we can move the rock and then, and then water our sheep. Well, when Rachel gets there, what does Jacob do by himself? He moves the rock by himself, like single-handedly. 
I mean, it almost seems like he's given like this super, super strength to do something that would typically take a bunch of shepherds. And, and by the way, when you think shepherds, don't think little, you know, precious moment shepherd, right? Shepherds were strong, mighty men, right? They had to fight off lions and bears. You know, we, we've been warped in our modern thinking, like with David, oh, he's this sort of sissy harp player who sits out among the sheep and skips in the, in the meadows. No, I mean, as is clear with David, and this is true of all shepherds, they are, they are warriors, they are strong. And so the, to, to the fact that it took a number of shepherds to move this rock, and yet Jacob did, does it all by himself, is probably significant. But that also may have been the hand of God. I mean, this may have been something that this was divine strength, like God was also showing his hand of, uh, of providence and, and his hand upon Jacob by allowing him to have this, this, this strength so that he could water his, you know, Ra Rachel's sheep, his, you know, Laban's sheep, and already establish that sort of connected, co connecting point uh, with Laban's family. So really throughout this narrative, God is, is evidencing his guidance. Uh, he's evidencing that by directing um, his steps, Jacob's steps, by giving him strength. And even we're going to see in, in, in subsequent weeks, even David, or excuse me, Jacob's continued cunning with Laban. Laban tries, tries to keep deceiving him. And we're going to see Jacob comes up with some really um, cunning ways of coming out on the other end of this thing, you know, really well off. And of course, you know, Jacob already was that kind of person, clearly, but God, uh, God is using this to provide for Jacob. And we've seen this with Abraham and Isaac, too, that even in the midst of circumstances that are a result of their own sin, God uses those things to actually accomplish his purpose. Like if you remember when Abraham went down to Egypt, against God's instructions, he lied about Sarah and all of that. What and then he ended up, you know, fleeing back to the promised land. What did he end up getting out of that? A lot of gifts from wealth Pharaoh. and servants. Pharaoh's like, take this stuff and get out of here. Okay. And we pointed out in that narrative that that was God accomplishing making Abraham a great nation, even through his own sinful actions and the consequences of his sins. We saw that with uh, Isaac as well, with his deception regarding his wife. And we're seeing this with Jacob. Again, he's here uh, under negative circumstances. And Laban does a whole lot of tricky things to try to get as much as he can out of Jacob. And yet we're going to see in a couple, you know, uh, in subsequent chapters, he comes out of this very well to do. One of the contrasts, though, that I think we need to make <clears throat> is with, with um, Abraham's servant coming and getting Rebecca, is how God chooses to guide. So if you remember, it's been a while, chapter 24, Abraham sends his servant to go get a wife for Isaac. And we, we, we've mentioned the fact that there are similarities between these two narratives, but there are also some significant differences. Um, can, you think of, can you think of any differences in, in how the servant uh went and got Rebecca and how Jacob is now coming to get his wives. It's been a while. Yes. That... He prayed a specific prayer, which was answered specifically the way we prayed. Okay, okay. So excellent. In the case of the servant of Abraham, there was definitely miraculous guidance that took place. So let me just read this and remind you, Genesis 24, verse 13. The, the servant prays to the Lord and he says, Behold, I am standing by a spring of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink and who shall say drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. And God does exactly that, right? So this is a miraculous, this is a supernatural guidance from the Lord. Does God guide Jacob in the same way? It's not, it's not supernatural. He just comes upon the right uh, well, happens to come upon shepherds who know Laban. Rachel happens to be coming right at that time. It seems like Moses tells it as if these are all coincidences. 
It's not supernatural. He doesn't pray and say, you know, Lord, please help the one I'm supposed to marry come to this well. It doesn't do any of that. There's no supernatural guidance. But are there any coincidences in God's plan? No, of course not. None of these things are coincidences. These are things that God providentially arranged. God didn't whisper to Jacob and tell him to go to this well. God didn't whisper to the shepherds and tell them to be there at a certain time. God didn't whisper to Rachel and tell her to be there at a certain time. There, there's nothing in the text that indicates there's anything supernatural or miraculous that's going on here. But is it any less the guidance of God? It's no less the guidance of God. This is still God's providential leading. And this is, I think, so important, important for us. We've got, you know, our cessationism conference coming up in two weeks uh, where we're dealing with, you know, people who believe that there are still miraculous gifts, prophecy. God still speaks to us like he did the prophets in the, in the you know, Old Testament, New Testament. And I think one of the reasons that people think that or want to think that is they fail to see that God leads providentially. And that that's just as amazing and miraculous, right? So the servant's response, when God answered his prayer, he prays that and behold, here's a woman and he, he says the things and she says exactly the right thing. He's excited, right? God has done this miraculously. Jacob is no less excited, even though it's not a miraculous guidance. It's a providential guidance. And that is how God leads us today. Does God direct our steps? He does. Does God lead us? He absolutely does. He leads us into his will. He leads us to make choices that please, pleases, uh, please him. But he doesn't do that through whispering in our ears, through prophetic visions and dreams, through writing it in the sky, through a feeling in our bosom, you know, any, any of that kind of language you hear. He doesn't do it through telling us audibly or through answering a, a prayer like the servant. God directs our paths and leads us providentially, and we shouldn't be less amazed by that. We should be amazed. And, and often, we don't recognize it until after the fact, right? Um, the, uh, Rick Phillips mentioned someone, I forget who it was, who, 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 who said something like, reading the providence of God is like reading Hebrew, because in Hebrew, you, you read backwards, right to left. And often we have to read the providences of God backwards. Like we don't, we don't recognize it when we're in the midst of it. But then we look back and we're like, that is amazing. Like all along, God was directing my steps. And we ought to have the same sort of response that Jacob had here, you know, weeping and kissing pretty women. No, um, you know, just being excited and being happy about the way that God directs our paths. And he does do that, and he does it providentially, and we shouldn't be seeking after what God has not promised. He's not promised any new revelation. We have the sufficient word. He's not promised to sort of give us give us impressions or, or visions or any of that. He's not promised that for this age. No, he's given us a sufficient word. We immerse ourselves in the word. We ask God for wisdom. God has promised if we ask for wisdom, he will give it to us. And then we trust that God will providentially direct our, st our steps. I think a lot of times we get, uh, we, 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 we sort of freeze because we're like, we, you know, here are two choices and I want to do the Lord's will. How do I know which is which? I need some, I need something. And, and God, and, and then when we don't get it, some sort of message from God, because he hasn't promised that we're, we're sort of frozen. No, we just need to do the moral will of God, make sure we're not disobeying anything God has forbidden, and we're doing everything God has, com has commanded. We're in his word faithfully. We get counsel from godly people. We're in, you know, uh, availing ourselves of the ordinary means of grace. And if we do all of that, then just make a decision. And, and God will use everything that has been in your life to lead you down the right path, and we can be confident of, uh, confident of that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Rosemary and I, in our, when I was listening to my prayer journal, the things that we prayed for in the past, I, I realized one time how small my faith was, in that we would have specific things that we were praying for, and then it it, it, it didn't happen. And what I came to realize out of that was that not wasn't necessarily not God's will; it just wasn't His time. Yeah. And so my faith was too small, and that I was saying, "Oh." God didn't do it when I thought he should do it. Right. So in my early years, I just quit praying for that item. And that was not right. 
continue to, if God has led me in that direction, continue to pray for said item, and he will either change the direction, change me in a different direction, lead me in a different direction, or he will fulfill it in some form or fashion or not. Yeah. But so many times we we just stop. And right. Well, it just wasn't God's will. Yeah. It's not true. Yeah, we can be confident that he's always going to answer. He always has a plan. He will lead and guide our, our steps, even if we don't always recognize it, right? Good. So Jacob then does respond with joy, with weeping, with, with kissing Rachel. Again, again, I think we ought to see that in a positive light with how Moses is laying out this text. It's simply he's, he's elated about this. And I'm sure he is also happy she's a pretty girl. Um, <clears throat> and then he also then, what's very clear in this text, is another way that Jacob responds is not only with joy, but also with faithful obedience. Uh, he's doing what God has told him to do, and he's actually also obeying his parents. And that is really indicated by Moses with a little bit of a sort of a highlighter exclamation point in the text because in verses 10 through 11, three times in just the span of two verses, Moses makes sure that we know it's Laban, his mother's brother. Verse 10, Laban, his mother's brother, uh, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Actually, this is one verse, right? In one verse, three times we have this, his mother's brother, which is emphasizing the fact not only God's providence, God has answered the prayer, God led him to the right place, but remember, Jacob is not doing this of his own initiative. He didn't He didn't come up with, you know, out of his own brain, I'm going to go find myself a wife, and I guess I'll just go to my mother's family. Who told him to do this? Uh, yes, his mother and his father. So Genesis 27, verse 43 Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, arise, flee to Laban, my brother in Haran. So, um, Rebecca had specifically told him to do this. And then uh, Isaac had repeated the same thing. Genesis 28, verse 2, Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So, so Jacob is, is obeying the Lord, and he's obeying his father, and he's obeying his mother. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, right? And that's exactly what Jacob is doing. And he's not just doing it out of duty. He's not doing it because he only fears punishment. Children, you ought to obey your parents because you're thankful for the way that God is working in your life. And you're thankful for the way that God directs your path. And that's exactly what uh, Jacob is doing here in this text. Okay, so he arrives. Uh, Laban obviously appears very uh, happy to see him. And yet, the second half of this narrative, which we've already pointed out, uh, we see a little bit of the consequences of Jacob's own sin coming back uh, to haunt him. And we find that Laban, you know, maybe Jacob got his deceptive sort of character from his mother's brother, because Laban is quite a, a, a deceiver as well. Um, in verse 15, when Laban says to Jacob, you know, he, he stays, stays with him a month. He's probably helping him. He's working. Uh, there with Laban. And then in verse 15, Laban says, you know, because you're my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? You know, that might seem like, well, he's just being a nice uncle. Like he's, well, I'm gonna, I want to pay you, right? Um, but we learn very quickly in this narrative that he's kind of a conniving man. He He probably has something in mind here. What do you think he has in mind when he's kind of like, all right, Jacob, um, yeah, you're working for me and you're my kinsman. So, you know, what, 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 what should I give you? What, what do you think he's, what do you think he's, he's thinking of? <laughs> the money Jacob's family has and how is he going to get some of that money? <laughs> By, he's got, so he's got these daughters and he knows Jacob's family is wealthy. How does he know that? Well, this is the second time he's been approached. Right. And what did the servant bring with him when he came to get Isaac's wife? Yes. He brought the, the 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 bride payment. He brought lots and lots of payment that that uh, was given over when Rebecca was sent back with the servant. And so you have to imagine that Laban is probably thinking the same thing. Like, where where's he got the stuff stashed? You know, <laughs> and how can I get some of that? Because right in the next verse, after he says that. Now, Laban had two daughters. You know, Moses has given us a hint here. There's a reason he's saying this. He's trying to sort of suggest to Jacob, hey, 
ask for one of my daughters and this is how I'm going to get some get some uh, some payment out of you. So he has two daughters and then we find this description and verse 17 this description of Leah is is the uh, object of a lot of debate and speculation is exactly what is what is uh, being talked about here. Her eyes were weak. What does that mean? Some say this means she was weak to the eyes kind of idea. Like she's, you know, not very pretty. And clearly she's not, she's not very pretty. Um, but actually, probably the word translated weak here, um, uh, it, it could be translated soft or delicate or dainty. It actually probably means she had pretty eyes. But that's sort of like saying she had a nice personality, you know. Um, so she had she had pretty eyes, but that's about all we can say for her. And then what does it say about Rachel next? But Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance, right? So Rachel had the entire beauty going for her, whereas Leah only had only had pretty eyes. Uh, Rachel was beautiful all over. Okay, so. So Laban uh, raises this. Moses tells us in the narrative, gives us the information about the, the two daughters. Mm -hmm. Clearly, verse 18, Jacob loved Rachel, but he has a problem. Whereas the servant of Abraham brought with him all the wealth to pay the bride price, does Jacob have any bride price? He doesn't. He doesn't have any money. He, he flew from, uh, from Isaac and flew from Esau, afraid for his life. And so instead of offering him a bride price, which is probably what what uh, Laban was looking for, he offers to serve um, Laban for seven years, which is not bad. Laban's probably pretty happy about this because not only does this mean he gets Jacob and his work for seven years, who also does he get for seven years? Mm -hmm. He still has Rachel for another seven years, and we saw that she's a shepherdess. She's, she's working uh, around the home. And so uh, it's not a bad deal. So he accepts the uh, arrangement. And Jacob uh, says in verse 20, serve seven years for Rachel. And notice this, lang this language here. They seem to him but a few days, right? Which just evidences, number one, his you know very devoted love for Rachel. He deeply loves her. He's This is well worth it. Seems like it flies by. He's anticipating his marriage. Uh, but it's also, I think, deliberately put here by Moses, because that phrase is the very same phrase that Rebecca, I keep in my mind, I'm like, am I right? Rebecca or Rachel, which one? Um, Rebecca, when she told him to go to uh, to Laban, um, she said, go and stay a few days, is what she says. She anticipates it's going to be a very similar sort of thing to what happened with, with the servant getting her. She remembers it, right? Just go a few days, arrange for the marriage, and come back. And it's not, it's now seven years, it's going to be 14 years, it's going to be longer, but uh, Moses is telling us, at least from Jacob's perspective, it was worth it. It seemed like exactly what his mother had said. It seemed like only uh, only a few days. Uh, but you know, to, to step back just for a se second, um, you know, e seven years, that's a very high price to pay for a bride. So he's sort of overbidding really, probably ends up in work hours paying more than what Abraham's servant paid for Rebecca. But notice that Laban doesn't, he just accepts it, right? If someone accepts your your first offer, it's probably too high, right? Uh, which is exactly what's going on here. So that shows, again, both Jacob's love for Rachel, his willingness to give that much, seven years. And it also shows a little bit under the surface what La what Laban's doing here, He's getting seven years out of Jacob, and he's also getting uh, Rachel for those seven years. And it's not a stretch to think right at the beginning of those seven years, he's already got a plan, right, for what he's going to do at the end of those seven years, which is exactly what happens. At the end of the seven years, Jacob says, all right, I've done my duty. I've paid my, my dues, so it's time for me to get my wife. And uh, Jacob is deceived. Obviously, over, you know, overall, the deception is similar to him deceiving Esau and him deceiving Isaac. But there's even on, on a more specific label, uh, level, as we look into the specifics of the narrative, um, some really s stark ways in which there are similarities between Jacob's own deception and the way that he's being deceived. 
Any any come to mind? What 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 about Laban's deception of Jacob? Really, really strongly parallels Jacob's own deception of his father. Okay. Massive. Yeah. I'm thinking with the bride, I mean, you're talking about your children and grandchildren, and the, the, the covenant blessing of the nation. Right. I mean, if it's the value. Yeah, excellent. So the, the, the lifelong nature, the, the, the high value, um, the, the birthright, the inheritance is a lifelong high valuable thing, and he's consummated the marriage. That's it's it's lifelong now, right? Cons lifelong consequences, definite definite parallels. Yep. Okay, the hiding of the identity of right Esau Jacob, him him veiling himself with hair on his arms and neck so that he's deceiving Jacob in that way. Uh, even the fact that Jacob, or excuse me, Isaac is veiled, he's blind, he can't see, and now Leah is veiled blinding Jacob from seeing the truth. Um, clear parallels there. Good. What else? There's one other really big one. Um, with his dad, it was food with him. He's probably hungry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. Yeah. I mean, I, I've often thought, like, how did he not know? Like, <laughs> How do you not know? Yeah, they're pro. I mean, Rick Phillips does, does does mention this. There probably was a little was a little alcohol involved, right? Uh, and it was dark, and she was veiled, and all of that. But still, I don't know. Um, yeah, so there, there, that is a parallel. But think about think about older and younger, right? The the, the idea of the older and the younger sibling. There was a sw switcheroo, right, that happened in terms of Jacob and Esau, and there's a reverse switcheroo here that happens in terms of Leah and Rebecca. And so again, these are. This is not just a storyteller making up fiction. You know, this is not just George Lucas having parallels between Anakin and Luke. You know, this is not just a. This is not just fiction. This is happening in the providence of God. God is arranging all of this providentially on purpose to teach Jacob lessons, to teach the Israelites lessons, and to teach us lessons as well. What goes around comes around, or to put it in more biblical uh, terminology, Genesis, um, excuse me, Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that will he also reap, right? God does this. Uh, we, we do something against his will. And it is often the case that God, again, in his providence chooses to return uh, in a parallel fashion in in a consequential, consequential fashion, a similar re result to what we have done that's not in accordance to God's will. And again, that's, that, that also is a grace, right? Because that's meant to teach us a lesson. Um, it is true, of course, that if we sin and there's some sort of consequences, hopefully we'll connect the dots and learn from it because of the consequences. But when the consequences actually mirror the offense, actually resemble the offense, we can't help but recognize, okay, this is from God. I'm, I'm receiving consequences for my sin. Right. There's no question. We don't we don't hear a lot from Jacob in this narrative, but there, there's no question when this happens to him, what immediately must have come to his mind. That this is the same thing I did. Right. And and, and again, that's a grace to him. This is teaching him a lesson, uh, instructing him. It's a consequence with instruction. Some consequences are just painful, and that is an instruction, but here God is really helping him see. Uh, that his own sin is being mirrored in what happens to him. So obviously he confronts Laban and all of uh, and and the arrangement with with finally getting Rachel. But we have a couple other details in kind of the last paragraph here that sort of seem to come out of nowhere. So we find in verse twenty four, for example, between the mention of Jacob marrying Leah, unbeknownst to him and the finding out about her in the morning. And even in the ESB, it puts it in parentheses, which there's no parentheses in Hebrew, but the editors are recognizing this is kind of a break in the narrative. Verse 24, Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be his servant. Now, why in the world would he include that little parenthetical piece of information? Well, she gives birth to some other Exactly. Okay, later we're going to find 
that um, that Jacob uh, has a couple sons by Zilpah. And they are, right now, the sons of Jacob are going to be whom? The 12 tribes of Israel, right? So imagine you are in the tribe of Gad, or you are in the tribe of Asher, and you're listening to this narrative, and then Moses just puts in parentheses, oh, by the way, when Jacob married Leah, which was a, which was a, a negative thing, right? He didn't want that. That wasn't, that wasn't arranged. One of the things that happened as a result of that was that Zilpah became part of Jacob's family as well. And you're part of Gad and you're part of Asher. And you're like, so if, if Laban had not deceived our father Jacob and he had not married Leah and he had not been given Zilpah, we wouldn't exist. And by the way, if you're one of the tribes that comes from Leah, you recognize there was deception here and this was bad and this was consequences of sin. But once again, you're reminded that God uses sin. He uses deception. He uses even what we see as negative things in our lives to actually accomplish God's purposes. And most of the tribes of Israel come from Leah, right? And so once again, evidencing... Christ comes from Leah, right? Uh, Judah comes from Leah and Levi, probably the two most significant tribes. The tribes of the priests and the tribes of the kings come from this woman that Jacob never intended to marry, never wanted to marry. Yeah. Let me be careful in the way I say this. When we're growing up, we look at women as our beauty. Women look at men for being handsome and rich. God just doesn't see it that way. Yeah. He particularly blessed Leah because she was so damn low on the cutting pole. Yeah. Yeah. And God often does that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the significance of the people God uses. Doesn't usually come from very beautiful women and handsome rich men. It comes from the leaders. The New Testament teaches that directly, doesn't it? Right? God God infrequently uses the wise and the wealthy and the powerful and the, the spectacular people. He uses the lowly uh, of the earth. And we see that here as well. Absolutely. Um it's not, you know, I think um it's true, you know, we think of the story of David and Samuel choosing David for the king and and looking at the 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 you know the older brothers who are stronger and and then what does God say to him? Man looks on the outward appearance, God looks in the heart, right? Which is a similar point. Um absolutely true. Um beauty, you know, play certainly plays into attract attraction between, you know, a, a male and a female. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But the point here is that beauty, strength, might, attraction is never ultimate, right? If it is, um, beauty is going to fade, right? If that's ultimately what uh, a reason uh, a man and a woman get married, if that's the only reason, well, then it's gonna, there's going to be problems later on. It's usually one of the first reasons. There's usually an initial attraction, um, but you, 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 you don't marry someone ultimately because of that, right? You marry them because of other qualities in the person. And, and it is absolutely true that God often will uh, will use the lowly, will use the ugly, will use those who we would least expect. And as we pointed out here, the son of God comes from the ugly, ugly sister, right? Who uh, from all outward appearances would not have been handpicked and wasn't handpicked by Jacob. Okay, so we have that mention there of Zilpah. Um, and then even later, verse 29, we have once again a mention of once he gets married to Rachel, in parentheses, Laban gave his female servant Bilhah, and Bilhah is the mother of Dan and Naphtali. So we have two what seem to be parenthetical, unimportant elements in this narrative, but that are very significant for the Israelites. Again, we always want to remind ourselves of the original, the first original audience of of the Pentateuch were the Israelites about to cross over to Jordan. And so Moses is giving them a little bit of their, their heritage. This is where you come from. Uh, and, and evidencing again, that it is in the providence of God that this takes place, which by the way, you know, there's not um, strict rules against polygamy yet uh, here. Um, but 
they, they're, they're coming. Uh, God does not want polygamy. So even in Jacob having children by Leah and by Rachel, which later in the law, not only is polygamy forbidden, but marrying sisters is explicitly forbidden, right? So this is not a good thing that's happening. And then he goes into his two, his wife's two servants. So the 12 tribes come from four women, which is not good. That's not what God intends. God intends one man, one woman for life. Four women is not a good thing. And yet, once again, Moses, God through Moses, is trying to emphasize to the, to the children of Israel and to us that God uses bad things in his providence to accomplish his good purposes. Um, there are 12 tribes. Not all of you came from the same mother. That wasn't good that our father Jacob went into four wives. And yet, uh, this is it, it results in positive things in terms of the, the tribes of, of, uh, of Israel. And then the final really point that Moses uses, God uses uh, to demonstrate and draw a connection between Jacob's own deception and uh, Laban's deception in verse 30, uh, 35 later, just mentioned this because it has to do with our text. Um, or did I write the verse wrong? I wrote the verse wrong. Let's see here. Um, oh, oh, yeah, no, it's right. Verse 25. I know what I did now. Verse 25 of this text where uh, Jacob says, what, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you with Rachel? Why have you deceived me? That word deceived is a close cognate with the same word used in chapter 27, verse 35. That's where 35 came, came from, where, uh, where Isaac said, your brother came deceitfully and he has taken away your blessing. So again, Moses is trying to just orally uh, we, we we hear it in English, just de deceit and deceitful. It's very similar in Hebrew, where uh, the people hearing this for the first time and even later reading this would recognize the connection between the two. But then we find in verse 30, and this brings us back to, you know, in the final verse, this discussion of Leah and her and her ugliness. You know, maybe she had pretty eyes, but that's all. Um, Jacob went in to Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah is what our ESV says, but even that's a little bit misleading. The word there really means rather than. And we're going to see the, the the fruits of this later in, in the narratives, right? It's not that he just loves Rachel more. He loves Rachel rather than Leah. And um, and that's a that's not a good thing, right? The, the polygamy is not good. The marrying sisters is not good. This is this is all not good. It results in some good things. But it almost seems like, you know, Jacob has been put in a positive light in this chapter. He's, he's recognizing the hand of the Lord. He's obeying his father and mother. Uh, he's working hard for his wife, all of it. But at the end, he's evidencing a little bit of the same sin of his own parents. Whereas they favored one son over the other, he is favoring one wife over the other to the degree that he's he's actually going to, in some ways, mistreat Leah, whom God is going to give the most sons. Once again, using the the less attractive to receive the you know most of the blessing. Um, and so there's you know Jacob's not perfect, and there's going to be some consequences uh, from this as well that then flow down to how he treats his own sons and what happens with his sons. So that's sort of forecasting a little bit just in that last verse forecasting what's to come, which the Israelites, you know, as, as, as the narrative is getting closer and closer to where they are, they probably know more of these details. And they're like, yeah, we know what happens. We know, we've heard of what happened to Joseph. We heard of what happened with all of the heads of our tribes and the conflict there. And uh, this is a little bit of a, a little bit of a foretaste. So overall, then in this chapter, this is really pointing us to the need for us to look for God's providential leading to rejoice when we see God providentially leading, to be to, to learn to recognize that, to learn to seek for it, to obey faithfully the Lord's commands to us, to use God's providence in our life to motivate us to do that, uh, but then also to recognize that our sin, nevertheless, will continue to have consequences, and that that won't change. Um, you know, sometimes we think that you know we sin, and then we repent, and we think, okay, I've repented, so there shouldn't be any consequences, right? Right? Happens sometimes with my own kids, right? I said, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm glad you said I'm sorry. That's what you should have done. 
but there's but sin still has consequences and we see that here in the life of jacob he seems to be doing what's right but he is going to reap all of that deception that got him got him to this place and so it is as i think i said last week or one of the a recent week i made the made the comment that is never right to do wrong to do right 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 um well this is why god's going to accomplish his purpose that's the thing, right? God has a plan and it's going to come to pass. The question is, we want to be sort of flowing with that plan, not having our sin being used to accomplish the plan because then it's painful along the way. And, and Jacob is a prime example of this. Everything happens exactly as God had planned. Everything, everything turns out in the end. But Jacob experiences a lot of pain. His wives experience pain. His sons experience pain. There's a lot of conflict that comes because of his deception earlier. And so that ought to be a lesson to us as well. All right, let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for your providential guidance in each one of our lives. We thank you for that. Help us to learn to recognize that and then to respond with lives of faithfulness, of obedience, of seeking to be fully in conformity to your moral will so that we will be used by you positively to accomplish the plan that you have set out to accomplish and not be in the place where you're having to use our sin and its consequences to accomplish what you have planned. We're grateful for the way that you guide and direct us. We're thankful for your word, which gives us wisdom and which tells us what you have for us. And we pray that we would live according to it in all that we do. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This is the this week of this